Hello everyone, this is Mr. Lawback. In this video, we are going to go over the War of 1812. Now this video would be considered part two compared to part one that I had put out earlier. So this is the second portion of the war and the results of the war. In this video, we are going to go over some of the key battles and events of the War of 1812, the Treaty of Ghent, the Hartford Convention, and the results and legacy of the War of 1812. So first, as a review, let's go over some of the causes of the War of 1812. So there are two main big causes, and there are other smaller causes. One cause would be the British impressment of American sailors. So remember, the British, in order to fight Napoleon on the high seas, they needed more sailors and ships. So they would impress and basically steal the American ships and kidnap the sailors. This obviously really angered the American public. And generally speaking, the British and the French did not respect American neutrality in their conflict. Another cause of the war is the increase in violence between Native Americans and Americans on the Western frontier. Now, to a certain degree, the British was encouraging and arming the Native Americans on the Western frontier. So as you can imagine, this also angered many Americans. So that's just an overview of some of the causes. Some of the other smaller causes would be the Chesapeake and the Leopard incident, the Warhawks led by Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, who pushed for war as a way to defend the American pride and reputation and wanted to expand into areas like Canada. Now, when we think of the War of 1812, a lot of people think, well, why go to war with the British and not the French when they are also not recognizing American neutrality? Keep in mind that the Democratic Republicans were in power during this time, and they were more pro-French and a lot more against the British. So let's talk about some of the key battles and events of the war. The U.S. military was very unprepared for war in 1812. They only had 12,000 troops and depended heavily on state militias. Many of the leaders of the military were still left over from the Revolutionary War era and were not very up to date on tactics and resources. Now, as war began, the U.S. tried to attack Canada on three separate fronts, and this was a big war hawk plan. The thought would be that once the Americans attacked Canada, the Canadians would back them because they felt they were tired of British rule. The Americans were severely mistaken in this. Now, as you can see here, the three-prong attack, the Americans attacked from Detroit into Canada, from Fort Niagara into Canada, and then from Lake Champlain into Montreal. Again, this tactic and plan was a miserable failure and actually led to an embarrassment for the Americans. The U.S. did have some early victories at sea. The U.S. Navy had gained experience from the Quasi War and the Barbary Pirates War. The U.S. Constitution, named Ironside, was able to defeat some British ships. And remember, the British Navy was by far the strongest navy in the world at this time. On Lake Erie, Admiral Oliver Hazard Perry defeated six British ships and famously stated, We have met the enemy and they are ours. This was a big morale boost for the U.S. Navy. At the Battle of York, which was part of the three-prong attack on Canada, in modern-day Toronto. The Americans burned the Capitol building, which would give the British an idea of revenge later on at Washington, D.C. Now, in another famous battle, as British troops tried to retreat at the Battle of the Thames near Detroit, William Henry Harrison defeated and killed Tecumseh. Again, this was a big momentum boost for the U.S. military. In the South, Andrew Jackson would win at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and defeat the Creek Indians, who were excellent allies with the British in the region. As the war with Napoleon was winding down, the British were able to focus more attention on the war with America. The British attacked Washington, D.C. and burned down the executive mansion, which we now know as the White House. After Washington, the British moved to Baltimore, a very important port city. They attacked Fort McHenry on the Inner Harbor, but the U.S. military was able to keep them at bay, and Francis Scott Key famously wrote the Star-Spangled Banner, which would eventually become the national anthem. A British effort to control the Mississippi River was halted at New Orleans 
by Jackson leading a force of frontier soldiers, free African Americans, that was considered a ragtag bunch. The victory was impressive as Jackson beat the Redcoats, killing 2,000 British troops and only losing 70 of his own troops. While the victory was very impressive and propelled Andrew Jackson into the national spotlight as a war hero, the victory was meaningless. The Battle of New Orleans had been fought on January 8, 1815, two weeks after a treaty ending the war had been signed in Ghent, Belgium. By 1814, the British were weary of war. Having fought Napoleon for more than a decade, they now faced the prospects of maintaining the peace in Europe. At the same time, Madison's government recognized that the Americans would be unable to win a decisive victory. American peace commissioners traveled to Ghent, Belgium to discuss terms of peace with the British diplomats. On Christmas Eve of 1814, an agreement was reached. The terms halted fighting, returned all conquered territory to the pre-war claimants, and recognized the pre-war boundary between Canada and the United States. The goal of the Warhawks to take over Canada was not realized. The Treaty of Ghent, promptly ratified by the Senate in 1815, said nothing about all the grievances that led to war. Britain made no concessions concerning impressment, blockades, or other maritime differences. The war ended in a stalemate with no gain to either side. So there was no clear victor in the War of 1812. Just before the war ended, the New England states threatened to secede from the Union. Bitterly opposed to both the war and Democratic Republican government in Washington, radical Federalists in New England urged the Constitution be amended and that as a last resort, secession be voted upon. To consider these matters, a special convention was held in Hartford, Connecticut in December of 1814. Delegates from the New England states rejected the radical calls for secession, but to limit growing power of Democratic and Republicans in the South and the West, they adopted a number of proposals. One of them called for a two-thirds vote of both houses for any future declarations of war or embargoes, and they also wanted to limit the term of the U.S. president to just one term. Shortly after the convention dissolved, news came of both Jackson's victory at New Orleans and the Treaty of Ghent. These events ended criticism of the war and further weakened the Federalists by stamping them as unpatriotic. So while the war achieved none of its original aims, it had a number of important consequences for the future development of the United States. Some of those legacies are as follows. Now the U.S. had survived two wars against Britain and felt they had gained respect around the world. The United States accepted Canada as part of the British Empire, which was always kind of up in the air until the War of 1812 was over. The Federalist Party basically came to an end as a national force and declined even in New England because of the War of 1812. Again, the Hartford Convention really hurt their reputation. Talk of nullification and secession in New England set a precedent that would later be used by the South. Now, a big loser in the war was American Indians, as they were forced to surrender their land to white settlers, and the British were forced to abandon them on the western frontier. A byproduct of the war was that the British naval blockade limited European goods to the United States. So U.S. factories were built up and the Americans moved towards the industrial self-sufficiency. And many historians believe that the war basically started the Industrial Revolution in the United States. War heroes such as Andrew Jackson and William Henry Harrison would soon be in the forefront of a new generation of political leaders. The feeling of nationalism grew stronger as did a belief that the future for the United States lay in the West and away from Europe. A final takeaway would be that the War of 1812 and the feeling of patriotism would usher in the era of good feelings and furthered Republican domination in American politics. The War of 1812 was certainly a significant turning point for the United States.